Good afternoon and welcome to the Association of Directory Publishers free member webinar. I'm Lisa, Director of Operations for ADP. Today's webinar is being presented by Digital Media Training, Powerful Prospecting Hacks to Help Your Sales Team Fill Their Pipeline. During the webinar, you may ask a question at any time during the presentation by using the question queue box located on the GoToWebinar dashboard. We will put it up for questions at the end of the presentation. As a reminder, ADP is holding their annual conference this May, the 1st through the 3rd, in Fort Worth, Texas. If you have not registered, please visit our website at adp.org for more information. At this time, I would like to go ahead and introduce Steve Bookbinder with Digital Media Training. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. And uh, hello to everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Bookbinder. I'm the CEO of Digital Media Training. I'm your lead trainer of that organization and your sales coach today. And uh, I'm so excited to share these hacks with you. Um, and, and let me just tell you, I've been a salesperson, a sales manager, a sales coach, a, a, a trainer. I've trained people that worked for me. I've been an outside trainer that's been brought in. I've trained other trainers. So I'm really familiar with what salespeople are going through and what trainers have to go through when they're, when they're talking to salespeople. And I have to tell you that, sadly, I've been doing this a long time. Prospecting is harder now than it's ever been. Uh, customers are today armed with technology designed to block us. And uh, so that, that wasn't always the case. But how do we get through? Because the best salespeople are, are, are confronted with the same challenges that uh, everyone is, and yet they're somehow breaking through. How do they do that? Let me walk you through the strategies. Uh, let's start with um, how we're going to get through this uh, program today. We're going to talk to you about tracking. And what you're going to see is that tracking is the most important thing, even though it's the most neglected thing, or it's just done poorly. Um, people say phone. Phone doesn't work. You know, you can't do phone. No, you can't do any one of these things all by itself. But what, what we have to do is blend them all. But when we do phone, we've got to do it differently than we used to do it, and we've got to do it in a certain way or, or it won't work at all. Email. There is as much to tell you about what to do as there is to tell you about what not to do with regard to email. You know, one of the things I want to encourage you to do is ask the most senior person in your company who must be barraged with uh, sales emails to forward you the emails that they're getting on a daily basis. And you'll see a lot of terrible emails, and you'll want to make fun of those emails. And I see people on LinkedIn making fun of those emails. I want you to make fun of them. And then I want you to compare how close your emails, I hope, aren't too close, but I want you to compare them. Because if, they're, if you're doing anything like the, you know, the millions of uh, terrible emails that are going around, then you're, you become categorized into that, uh, into that category, and that's not good. You, you want your emails to stand out. Um, social media. I meet people uh, all over the world. I work with salespeople all over the world, and I've literally met more than 50,000 salespeople. So I've met, all, and I meet all kinds of salespeople. Um, but I meet salespeople who say to me, Steve, I'm not uh, into social media. I'm not a, um, I'm not a LinkedIn kind of guy. Hello? Uh, I'm not a LinkedIn kind of guy, they'll tell me. And, uh, and I'll say, uh, well, okay, well, if you're not a LinkedIn kind of guy, in today's world, that makes you a kind of a, like a, a witness protection program kind of guy. And so you don't want to be, you want to be doing that. And networking, there's all kinds of great networking opportunities, and we've got to use them um, uh, as lead generation tools. And we've got to think of them in that way. And, um, and so I'm going to walk you through how all these uh, are necessary. They all need to be in a blend like a cocktail. We need to do a little bit of each, and uh, let's walk through them. First, start with tracking your numbers. What KPIs, key performance indicators, should you be tracking? Well, let me just tell you this. What you track is the thing that will improve. So if you're tracking how many proposals you show against how many contracts you close, um, 
uh, or how many proposals you close a month, uh, or how many proposals you show a month, whatever number you you, you collect, that's what you're going to uh, uh, you're going to improve because in tracking causes improvement. You can't help yourself once you start putting the the number down, you know, in an Excel or writing it on a piece of paper. You can't help but you know, say to yourself, well, how can I get it better? And you kind of cheat. For example, if I wanted my proposal to close ratio to get better, you know what I'd do? I'd only show my proposal to people who I kind of thought were only going to were going to buy. I wouldn't even show it to people who I didn't think were going to buy. Well, you know what that would do? That would dramatically improve that ratio. And you know what I did as a result of that? That I now close close to eighty percent of my proposals. Why? Because I don't even show a proposal. I don't even go through the effort of creating a proposal unless and until I have an 80% chance of closing. How do you like that? You know what that's done for me? Stopped wasting a lot of time writing proposals, which in fact did not close, which isn't an activity, which I felt was the best use of my time. So, uh, you know, that's a strategy I have. My KPIs reflect that strategy. Um, uh, uh, and when you think about your, your KPIs, one of the things you want to think about is you, are your goals and your time aligned? So, for example, if you've got big goals over the next few years, then you're going to need renewal sales that grow over the next few years, which means that right now you need a lot of new business. But new business prospecting takes a lot longer than uh, existing business prospecting. And so it takes a lot longer to create an appointment with somebody you don't know then to create another appointment with an existing customer to upsell them or add on or find some one-off kind of a thing. And so are you allowing for enough time not only to make those calls and do those emails and everything else, but generate the lead in the first place? So if you're not managing your time in that way, in other words, if none of your time in the course of a day goes to lead gen or goes to calling somebody new, then you know it's not going to happen. You're not going to be finding anybody new, and you're not going to be generating any new business this year that will turn into renewal income in the following years. So that's the kind of thing what I'm talking about when I talk about time management. And finally, just be aware that tracking causes improvement. Look at that ratio. And one of my favorite things about tracking is it gets you into a streak. And streaks are hard to break. Psychologically, if you've made a streak like every day, I'm going to call one new person or something like that. Every day I'm going to source one new lead. If you just did that, uh, so, uh, uh, that would be uh, wonderful. Okay. Outbound phone calls. I used to be the world's worst phone call maker. I was just terrible. I don't even know what I used to say. I think I, I don't. Even, I, I think to the other person, my calls sounded like this. Hi, I, I, I don't know why you'd want to talk to me. I certainly wouldn't. But anyway, my boss makes me call people. I don't even want to call people. My, my boss makes me call people, so here I am calling you. I, you know, and so anyway, I sounded like that, and they would, you know, whatever their objection was, I just hung up the phone, and I felt, I just felt like, why did I pick sales as a career? But now, now when I've slowed down the game and know what's going to happen next, I uh, immediately. I've taken control and actually have fun doing outbound calling. So you've got to understand the dynamic of the call. Let's take the call from the point that you have the person you're trying to get, you actually are talking to them. Now, I know what you're thinking. Yeah, but how do you get them on the phone? I know. We're going to get to that second, if you don't mind. First, let's talk about what happens when we do have them. Okay? We get the person on the phone. And by the way, it's not going to happen that much, so we have to be really, really good at this. So we get them on the phone. And it's going to go in these pieces. They're going to say, or we're going, we're going to say, our name. We're going to say our. We're going to get their attention by saying who we are. We're going to ask them a, a, a qualifying question about something about them, and then we're going to give them a reason for calling. And that reason's got to be articulated as if we said, the reason I'm calling, I, last night at 3 a.m. I felt I woke up out of a sound sleep, determined to call you. Because I realize that you and I need to get together because I think there's such a great business advantage of the two of our companies work together. Now, not obviously not in those words, but in that sound. But what I do find is that when I listen to salespeople's calls, very often their phone calls sound like they're at the end of the day and they're tired and they're exhausted and, they, and it, it doesn't make any sense. And the worst part about uh, outbound calls, if you made a, an appointment on the very first call of the day, you'll be lifted the rest of the day psychologically. 
But if your very first 40 calls of the day all result in the customer hanging up on you, your 41st call begins to sound like, you know, you're walking uh, 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 to the uh, gallows. And so uh, you need to make sure that every new call sounds as if you're just having the best day. Now, of course, why would you be having a great day? Because sales are good. Why would sales be good? Because people like what you're offering. They find value in it, and they're buying from you, as opposed to you sound tired. Why would you be tired? Because you're not busy. Why would a salesperson not be not busy? Because nothing's really going on. Nobody really finds any uh, advantage in you. That's what you can't get arrested in this town. That's what you begin to sound like. So you want to sound like you're a very busy person who uh, just uh, just enjoys being uh, very busy. So we're gonna. So let's make sure we have the reason statement, the reason we're calling nailed down. The reason should sound as close as possible to a to a, a referral call. So in an actual referral call, so if Mr. A says to me, call Mr. B, so the actual referral call would be, hey, Mr. B, Mr. A told me to call you. Although in my uh, experience, what I found is if I dressed it up a bit, if I call Mr. B after Mr. A said to call him, even if it's, even if it's the president who said to call the uh, head of marketing, I get Mr. B on the phone. And I say, Mr. B, did Mr. A tell you I'd be calling? Oh, now, basically saying the same thing, but by doing it that way, I'm just in ever so uh, sl slowly injecting into this conversation this massive dose of enthusiasm and energy and urgency. And if we, you and I, don't add those elements, those elements won't be there. And uh, so it's, it's half of the battle is the words that come out of your mouth, but the other half is the... Um, is the tone and the performance that you have, your excitement and your own enthusiasm. Because whatever you say is uh, you create a flow, and all responses are anticipated. So after we say whatever we say and the reason that we said what we're saying, well, you know what we need to uh, prepare ourselves for? That regardless of what we say, they're going to have an objection. Their objection is going to fall into one of four categories. The objection is going to be some version of they're not interested, or some version of I'm happy now. Or some a version of, just send me something. Or some version of a direct question. Don't me, just tell me, uh, how much is it? Something like that. A, a question that at that moment, you'd actually prefer not to have to answer. You really want to say to that question, I, I really don't want to answer that question right now. So rather than hope that they don't answer the, ask those questions, I find that the more confident we are in dealing with those four objections, the smoother the whole rest of the call is going to go. And so let's start there. So if they say not interested, I'm going to give them a short version of this very true but long story. They say, I'm not interested. I'm going to say, you know, a lot of people currently work with me. And many of them have been working with me for a really long time. And many of them, way back, when I first call them, guess what they said? Same thing you're saying right now, that they're not interested. And they were not interested. They thought they weren't interested. They said they weren't interested until they started working with me. And then they realized, wow, there's a real advantage in working with me. And now they like working with me. But I'm going to say that in a much shorter way, obviously. They say that interested. I'm going to say, you know, others have said that before they saw how we can benefit them. I'd like to show you how it's Tuesday at 3. Others have said that before they saw how we can be benefit them. Others have said that before they saw the advantages. Now, I'm going to tailor that, because the more I can tailor it to literally what they just said, then the more customized it is, the more it sounds like I'm listening, and the better it works. So if they say to me, uh, you know, I don't think we're going to be interested because I don't think we can afford it. I'm still not interested, but now it's specifically about money. You know, others have said that before they saw how we could work within their budget. Yeah, I don't think we could do that because I don't think I have the time. Others have said that before they saw how we could save them time. See how that's going to work? Now, on the other hand, they might say, no, no, we've already got it. Hi, uh, hi the reason I want to talk to you is blah, 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 blah. Steve, let me just stop you there. We're happy now. We're all set. We got it. We, 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 we're buying from your competition. We're getting that already from them. Now, I've got one or two uh, choices on that one. I could either argue with them. Well, why are you going with them? Who are they? You know what? I hate to tell you this. Bad move, pal, because they stink. We're much better. I can't believe you're working with them. You should at least give me half, if not all, of the money you're giving them. But please, I'm going to just sit here until you do. Like, you know, that's, why would you think you're going to win that argument? 
On the other hand, suppose you said, oh, my goodness, did you just say, did, you, did I just hear that you're working with the uh, XYZ company? Perfect. Perfecto. You know why? Because a lot of other people who work with them have found that by adding us, it complements, it enhances, it adds to, contributes to, improves the yield you get from simply only working with them. That's right. I can complement what you're getting from them. I could make your current investment in that thing you're doing yield better results, work better. In fact, a lot of my companies, a lot of my customers who use me also use them. That's why. Because the two things together, oh my God, you're not, as if you were saying, you're not only not disqualified by virtue of the fact that you're using my competition, but in fact, you're extra qualified. And now there's an even stronger reason we should meet. If they say, just send me something, I'm going to say I prefer not sending anything. I prefer getting together instead. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. If eventually I need them to send me money, well, if they won't even send me a calendar invite, if they won't even allow me to walk into their office, what are the odds they're eventually going to send me money? Well, I figure, why not take a shot at that? And by the way, does it work every time? No. But what does the word it works even mean? Works, in my view, means it works one more time. If it used to work one out of a hundred times, and now it works one, I mean, uh, two out of a hundred times. So it, in the first case, it didn't work 99 out of 100 times. But in the second case, after you got it to work 2 out of 100, it now didn't work 98 out of 100. So if you look at it from that perspective, you're not getting the, gaining the insight. The difference between 1 and 2% is 100%. I want to get 100% improvement all the time on every little thing I can, including being able to turn around these uh, uh, objections when they, when they get thrown at me. And finally, direct question. And I could use this solution all the time. If you ask me a question, for example, um, uh, uh, Steve, let me uh, interrupt you a little bit. Uh, the reason, uh, how much is it? You know, here's what you want to say. Uh, I, I, it depends. Uh, but they're going to say, what do you mean it depends? Hey, let me guess. Let me just guess. Uh, let me guess. The more I buy, the more it costs, right? Is that how that works? Uh, the less I buy, the less it costs. But, but, but let me also guess this. The more I buy, the less per unit, the quantity discount will, will kick in. Is, is that right? And I might go, yeah, how did you know? Well, they'll say, oh, well, because I live on Earth as well, and you know, it works the same over here, and it works that, that same way everywhere. So rather than give a, a ridiculous answer like that, why not actually begin to answer? Now, here's, of course, the problem. It actually does depend. But since they won't be satisfied with that, and since when we don't answer their direct question, they can't stop thinking about that, and they're not going to listen to anything else until we do. So let's just get that off uh, uh, off their plate by simply um, responding to it in this way. Customers like yours typically buy between X and Y per day, per month, per campaign, per year, per cent of their budget. Customers like you typically spend that percent. Uh, 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 but now, now that I've begun to answer your question, you will more likely answer mine. And the question I'm going to ask you is actually going to change the subject, but I'm going to ask you about something that we both care about more, something that I typically can help you do better. So if what I think I could help you do better is improve efficiency, I might say, what are you doing now to improve the efficiency of the campaigns you're running? And they're going to say something like, well, I'm either doing something or I'm not doing something. If they say we're not doing something, they're going to go, you know, a lot of people tell me they're not doing something. And they find there's a real advantage to doing something with it. Yeah, but you know what? I don't think I can afford that. I know. A lot of people think that until they see how we could work within your budget. I'd like to show you how it's Tuesday at 3. You see how that works? If you practice these skills, you can get great at that. All right, let's go to email. Okay, we're going to talk about email in two ways. First, appointment setting. Let me, let me, let me explain what I'm talking about. There are two kinds of emails that you and I will send as salespeople. The first kind of email is the kind that might work in conjunction with a phone campaign, where what we're looking for is an appointment, a first appointment. Now, I have first appointments in this kind of way, in these ways. It's a first appointment if I never met you. you it's a company I never called, person I never met, you know, classic first appointment. Or, could also be a first appointment in this respect. I've met you at your company a year ago. 
And we actually met once. Didn't go anywhere. You know, maybe went a meeting or two, but never really went anywhere. Um, months went by, and I've just sort of restarted, just picking it up again. So that's another kind of uh, uh, first meeting. Another kind of meeting it could be. It's an, it's an actual existing customer, and I'm asking for them to uh, meet me again. Um, and so, uh, so it's one of those kind of appointments. So I'm trying to generate what we call a first appointment. The, 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 the one that will kick off a sales process. Now, if, if I can't get an appointment, at some point I have to move you to my other uh, email, uh, which is my lead nurturing email, which we'll discuss next. Okay, so let me just go back to uh, appointment setting. So here's, here's one of the things I want you to do. First of all, whenever you're sending any email, say to yourself, how do I know this email will work? And so before you come to any conclusion, I want you to realize that you can't know. The answer is data and not gut. So come up with two emails, one A and one is B, and send them both to half the list each. And in each case, you're going to have a – by doing it this way, you're going to have a much better sense of what works and what doesn't work. So test different language, length, time of day, day of week. Uh, uh, approach you use, how formal, one has attachments, one doesn't, like all of those things, test it all in an A, B, or an A, B, C test. Every time you do an email blast to try to get um, appointments, you want to be testing different things. You could test them every month. You could test, you know, to test them in a way. Make sure you test them, that you allow the test to go long enough that you can get uh, statistically significant uh, numbers from them. So do that. Second, um, I want you to make sure that your appointment setting emails look like a note. Look like a note. Look like a note that a roommate might leave for another roommate. Because I'll tell you what I see. I see all kinds of mistakes with emails. I see, first of all, it looks formal. It looks so, I don't even have any idea what you have to, what you do. They, 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 uh, 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 you know, they make crazy assumptions. Long pitches. Hi, I want to get together with you. And let me give you this really long pitch. It has nothing to do with you. Well, you know what? If you're going to write to me, if I bother to read it, then if you ask me a question or you have one thing that's compelling, maybe I'll get on the phone with you. Maybe I'll respond. But if you're asking me to drop everything and read and click and re go to another page and read a bunch of things, I'm probably not going to do that. If you're writing to get an appointment, is like sending a resume. Why do you send a resume? To get a job? No, to get an interview. Why do I send you an email? To get you a, a clothes? To get the contract? No to get you to talk to me so that I could make an appointment with you or get you to exchange emails with me so I could do that. So I want to do that. So uh, look, at, look at terrible emails. Look at your own. If yours don't look short, they should be short. They, shouldn't, uh, they should look like a personalized note. Um, the, the fewer the words, the better is my uh, uh, um, advice for you in that, in that respect. But here's the key. We assume that the first email goes nowhere. So now we're stuck with the second email and usually a third email is eventually before you give up. So you have to decide on what's the frequency cap. How long will you go before you stop sending an email? Um, for me, it's three times in a month. That's, that's my number. After that, I, I assume if you're not responding to my emails, after three times in a month, you either don't want to or you can't. Um, but beyond that, uh, uh, within that, I want to make sure that my – my, I remember I said I have an A mailing and a B mailing. Well, each one of them is going to have three email waves. In other words, that first email, which I'm really hoping the other person responds to, but I'm also being realistic and realizing they probably won't or maybe a lot of them won't. So I've got this second email that will go out and then a third email that will go out. And let's have the second email and the third email be reasons to talk to me, but not this. Hi, I'm writing to see if you saw my first email. You're writing to see if I have my – I, I can't tell you, half of the sales emails I get, we get that. Why would you say that? Let, let, let's say best case scenario they did. What did you learn from that experience? That they then, after reading it, didn't call you. So why would you want to bring that bad news up again? You know, so you want to move on from there. Okay. But now let's say that you don't uh, get through. I'm not going to worry about that because I, I know that in today's world, one of the reasons it's harder to reach people um, also makes it easier to reach people if you make it possible for people who are looking 
to find you. So now let's get into lead nurturing. See, where the difference between lead nurturing and trying to get an appointment is this. I'm trying to get an appointment. It's all about me. Hey, let's get together so potentially I could sell you something. I'd like to potentially get you to buy something from me. Potentially, maybe you could pay me for something. Versus lead nurturing, where what I'm going to be giving you through by way of an email is something of value. Every time I send you something, it's going to have value. It's going to have an article that, based on what you do, not me, what will you do, I think you'd be interested in this thing. It's as if I was scouring the industry on your behalf, saw this thing, and I thought you would be interested in it. It's a third-party study. It's an invitation to something. It's a lookout for something. It's a, you know, it's, it's a piece of information, generally. So I want them to associate emails from me with value. I'm, I, you know, One of the things I think about with regard to a relationship is, of all the times you talk or communicate with a customer, of all those times, how many times are you asking them for money versus you're not asking them for money. So if every single time I meet with you, I'm asking you for an appointment, I'm asking you for money, um, I think our relationship is very different than if a lot of the times I talk to you, actually just ask, I'm giving you some information. I hardly ever reach out and ask you for money. And that's kind of the boat that I want to be in. That's why I like lead nurturing. So after that third time in a month that they don't uh, take my, uh, I'm not meeting with them, I'm going to, oops, I'm, oops, I'm sorry. I'm going to move into my lead nurturing. Here's some of the things I want to think about with that. Um, every uh, month, I want to be sending something new. In our case, we actually have a free newsletter. We have a, a free newsletter. At the end of this, uh, you're going to see my um, contact details. I encourage you to sign up for the free newsletter. First of all, it's free. But second of all, it's got a lot of fu funny and amusing and interesting things. Uh, uh, but we, but I also want you to see it because I want you to see an example of what I'm talking about. Y you should have your version of that, if not weekly, at least monthly where you're sending, if not a formal newsletter, at least an email out that says, hey, I have a lo I'm have looking out for you. But when you're sending out to your list, you want to think of not everybody in one big group, but the personas. So every different person is a persona. And the more granular you think of these personas, for example, you know, in today's world, there's no decision makers. But what there are are, are influencers. There's there's um, commercial dis uh, 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 managers, uh, super users, uh, senior executives, uh, financial decision makers. Um, so you might want to put your your clusters, your segments in that you know in that kind of a title way, or big customers, or potentially large budgets, or however you do that. But the more segmented it is, then every email that you create, you're going to create template email templates to send to these segments. But I want you to have not one template for the whole group, but I want you to have 20 segments, you know, for a group of 100 people. Because the more granular it is, the better those templates are going to work. And you're going to keep fine-tuning it. The uh, challenge of trying to uh, make a, a one-size-fit-all template is that nobody will read your emails. By the way, if nobody reads your emails, they're sending out a lot of emails. That's a problem. Because in today's world, emails that really, uh, email lists, that include bad emails or people that take take you off their list, uh, the, the emails that lead to emails that bounce bounce rate email bounce rate uh, email bounce rate leads to your emails end up in spam folders. So you want to make sure that you're doing a great job uh, uh, cleaning up your email list and sending people emails that uh, that they're going to find interesting and and uh, not everybody that stops reading it unsubscribes. That's another thing. So you want to be aware of that. Um, on the other hand, thing, here's the other thing about emails, though, that is great. Of all the ways you can communicate with people, there are the fewest moving parts with regard to email sending. It only really has to go through an Internet service provider to get into their email. Not a lot of you know, apps and things of that nature uh, to finally get in, as opposed to other forms of communication that we have. So if I send you an email, there's a pretty good chance you're going to uh, at least it will get to your inbox. So, um, you know, that's one of the, the things I like about emails. Um, social media. A couple of things on social media. First of all, get on, get on the social media platforms that your customers are on. Assuming that it's LinkedIn, let's do these things. Let's find our customers on, in LinkedIn. Not only just find their profile, but let's find them. Wh who do they, what discussion groups do they belong to? What, um, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? thought leaders, uh, blogs are they following, tw tw tweet, Twitter feeds, uh, 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 feeds that they're following, 
uh, people that they're, that they're following on social media. You know why? Because the more you and they know the kinds of things in common, the more you'll find people in common, you'll bring that up in a conversation, you'll refer to their hot buttons when you're reaching out to them, you'll have an opportunity to communicate with them through the social media. So one of the things I like to do is do that. The thing I like to do is find and get involved in, in discussion groups. But you have to be careful. You can't sell in a discussion group. It's salesy to do anything. And you know what's weird? If you've never been in a discussion group, this is what everybody's experience is. You never go in, you never go You finally go into a discussion group. And it'll be, for example, my, I, my, the name of my company is Digital Media Training. So we do digital media training. We teach people about digital media. So I, just, I joined a discussion group that's got the words digital media right in the title of the discussion group. First day I joined, there's people asking this very question. Where would I go? to learn more about digital media, is there a training organization anybody would recommend? Well, that would normally be my cue to now jump all over that with, hey, me, call me, call my company, here's my links. Let me give you a whole sales pitch on why we're so great. But anything even remotely like that would kick me out of that discussion group. So, in fact, um, I actually just watched to see what would happen. What happens? What would have happened if I wasn't uh, a part of this group? What would normally happen? And you know, watch that flow. And you want to do that, actually. You want to just sit back as if you had joined a cocktail party. You walked into a cocktail party, and the, you saw a group of people standing around holding their martini glasses. And one of them is holding the in the center of the group, holding everybody's attention, telling a story uh, of when they went on vacation. You wouldn't interrupt their story to tell your story. And in that same way. Go into a discussion group, watching and getting a feel for the uh, a feel for it. But when you finally engage, engage by asking questions rather than giving answers. Uh, what I find was on occasion I will get into a conversation. It'll start as a sort of group conversation, dwindle down to just me and one other member, who will then say, "Could we communicate, you know, by way of my email address or call me at this number?" And I've actually turned a bunch of uh, LinkedIn conversations into phone conversations. Use social media, uh, and there's just no end. Also, make sure with social media that your LinkedIn profile and other profiles are updated, but particularly your LinkedIn profile. Updated, not only updated with regard to your description of your current job, but go back and re-describe your old jobs so that your entire life looks like you're on a mission to help customers like them. That's what you, I should read in your profile. And I want you to give me an update all the time because your updates are like a free ad to everybody that you're connected to, which is my last piece of advice. Make sure that you're thinking like a marketer and you're adding to your followers and your connections every week. Build your online persona and presence. Personal marketing. Is the uh, uh, is the way uh, you're going to uh, get people to know you? You're going to constantly syndicate content that's interesting to people that are in your business. Show yourself to be an expert. Um, l l leverage your LinkedIn, following the, uh, the strategies that are shared. With you. Okay, networking. A uh, couple things about networking. First of all, there's all kinds of, there's actually formal networking events. I, I like you to, to go to those things. The problem is that you want to go to the right kind of events so you're not just meeting other salespeople. Um, but get an elevator pitch down so that when people say, what do you do? You have a great way of describing it so that they can easily articulate that to somebody else. Um, but my way that I like is partnerships. I look for organizations and individuals and one-person companies who sell to the same people that I sell to. In fact, sometimes I call them allies. And they sell to the same people I do, and they um, don't directly compete with me. So selling media, I sometimes can work with an ad agency. Not every kind of agency, sometimes only certain kind of agencies. I used to work for an SEO agency, and we would align ourselves with a general agency. So there's always some organization. Years ago, I was working with a different sales training organization, and I uh, allied. I found an ally, uh, a salesperson that was working in the um, a portable trade show booth business. So he sold to the senior sales management of big companies, 
sell them portable trade show books. And I sold to senior sales management of big companies, sell them a non-competing co- a, a product, an offering. And so we would trade leads every month. We could talk to each other about uh, companies, and, and actually uh, another salesperson will give you information about another company that you could never learn from anybody, from any database, from any other place. So I, I highly encourage you to do that. And uh, the more of those uh, kind of alliances you can get, um, uh, the better off you're going to be. All right. Uh, well, um, uh, uh, we're going to open up the door for questions. And um, uh, I also I, I mentioned to you that we have a free uh, newsletter. It's called Finally Friday. You see mention of it here. But uh, following this um, webinar, I want you to feel free to reach out to me if I can help, if you have, if you have any questions or want to make a suggestion to me. Uh, but before that, can I see if we have any any questions um, from our audience? Sure, Steve. We do have a few. And as a reminder to everyone, if you have a question, just take a moment and type it in the question queue box to the right on the GoToWebinar uh, keyboard right there. Uh, question number one is, when researching a new lead, what should I be looking for? Uh. Good question. So the ideal scenario is that something is changing on the other side. And so I want to call companies that, as I uh, think about calling them, I could imagine a positioning statement that I could say with great enthusiasm about how my solution is right now currently uh, a really good fit given something that's going on in their business. So given some change in their business, I thought it would be a good time to meet with you and talk about this thing that we've got. So I, if I can't find a way to make that uh, positioning statement, that I don't make that lead. So I've gotten pretty good at being creative and coming up with these positioning statements. But it's, get, it's getting myself all worked up with that positioning statement. It's, it's not only part of my rehearsing, but it's also part of the preparation. What other questions there? Another question is, is there anything I shouldn't do when prospecting, and how much time should I dedicate to it? Um, first of all, let's do the second part of that question first. How much time? A year from now, always ask yourself, a year from now, what will I wish I had done today? So, you know, for many years I was looking to lose some weight. And a, you know, it'll be a year later. God, I can't believe I didn't lose that weight. A, a year from now, I wish they had started a diet a year ago. You know, if that's what I want to see happen. Uh, you know, a year from now, you know what I'd like in sales for things to be easier. You know what I'd really love? People calling me. Or, or how about this? When I'm calling people, I'm calling people. I'm saying, hey, we spoke eight months ago which you said then was the wrong time, but you said now is the right time. So it was now eight months later, and you told me to call you. I want every month 50 people who said call me this month, no matter how long ago we first spoke. So I, so I want that. So to get things that are go- going to pay off in the long term that finally happen, we have to spend a little bit of time on them every day. So the answer to that question in a long way, how much time prospecting every day? In some degree, every day. You should be personally marketing every day, meaning that you're sending out emails, you're nurturing leads, and you're constantly adding to that list. Um, the, the, uh, the first part was are there things not to do. The thing not to do is this. Don't overcall the same lead. There is a point of diminishing returns, but with some people, we, be, we become obsessed with because we're so sure that we're the right thing for them and all they're, they're missing out by not calling us. We get like emotionally in, uh, attached to them. And uh, we've got it because when you overcall one lead, you're undercalling other leads. And that's the opportunity cost. Any other questions? Yes. What is your advice for getting past gatekeepers? Um, the first is that we have to make, we have to remind ourselves that the gatekeepers are simply doing their job. So their job is to block salespeople and to take messages. So, the, so we, the, that is what they're supposed to do. And so, we, but whenever you help people do what they're trying to do, um, uh, you, you, you the relationship goes better. So I already know their script. They're going to say, "Who is this? Do they? Uh, why are you calling? Do they know you're calling?" What's it about? So I just beat them to it. I just get to the answer slightly before them, or I change the order slightly so that I could say, um, uh, this is Steve Bookbinder. Oh, by the way, is he in? 
you know, like I, I, I interrupt myself to ask a question. Is he in? And so when it, no, he is, he is not in. Oh, do, oh, so could you leave? Could I leave a message for him? Oh, sure. Yeah, could you tell him that Steve Book? Oh, when will he be back? Oh, probably later today. Uh, you know, so I, I, throw, I interrupt myself to ask questions. Sometimes I'm able to say, are you able or are you in control of their calendar? And I would tell you that it's got, it got to be the higher the level of person. It's got to be like somewhere between 10 and 20% of the time. They'll tell me that, in fact, this gatekeeper can either influence the calendar or directly controls the calendar or adds the calendar. And I was like, great. It, 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 can you see if they're free next Thursday at 2? Uh, yeah, I think they are. I said, okay, that's what I want to so when they go, So that's what it's about, next Thursday at 2. So, right, you see how I'm doing that? So I'm going to um, uh, I'm, I'm helping them complete their message taking, and at the same time weaving in the asking for the message, honoring them by respecting them with my I'm sure your responsibilities are great enough to handle calendars, and then just work with them. Be as nice as possible too because they're in that position. Um, good. Any other questions? Uh, yes, looks like uh, we have one more. What KPIs should I be measuring? Um, well, the, first of all, we have to remember that as much as it's great to gather data, unfortunately, I believe salespeople, and I'm one of us, so I'm making fun of myself when I say this, salespeople are terrible record keepers. We're not good at tracking things. If we were good at tracking things, many of us wouldn't even have gone into the sales business. Instead, we would, go, would, would have gone into the tracking business. And so, um, you know, like accounts. So, uh, so here's the things that I recommend you, you track. Um, count your uh, uh, call activity, um, uh, but not email activity in terms of the number of emails. So if you're going to call people, I want you to make very strategic use of the phone. So only call people who, you, you know, that are high enough level to call and it's worth calling and you should block out some time to call them. Um, but when it's painful for a lot of people to even pick up the phone and make these calls. So when you're making calls, you might want to like block out a half hour, give yourself over right, five or ten leads, and just knock out those five or ten leads. And then so you could track. Okay, every time I do this, I do ten leads or twenty leads, and I in that I end up talking to the next and that the, the next uh, KPI, the number of people you're talking to, completed calls. So I dial this number, I got that number of completed calls. Let me just stop there. You can improve your dial to completed call ratio overall, over time, mostly, by not over calling the same lead. So the mistake that most people make is they call somebody and then they call them again tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. And so one of the ways we know that they're doing that is looking at that dial to completed call ratio. You're over calling the same lead. Obviously, calling people that are not going to be interested in you probably works against you as well. Um, uh, uh, so that's another thing. Calling people and leaving a message so that they call you back works. But not leaving a message doesn't work. There's a lot of people who are no longer returning calls unless a message is left. But to leave a long message is a mistake. So I like to leave a very short message. So a message has short four parts. Uh, it's your name. Hi, it's Steve Bookbinder, your company. I'm Digital Media Training. Uh, it's your, uh, and then I'll do the reason for calling and my phone number. And the reason I'm calling is to tell you about next Tuesday at 3, talk to you about next Tuesday at 3, my phone number is blah, 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 blah. And so uh, the shorter the message, the better it works. The shorter the reason that you're calling, the shorter the message, the better. The, you know what does work? Long ones. They, they end up sounding like Tom Clancy novels. So you want to be careful of those. Uh, so, so we want to count down, dials to completed calls. Completed, uh, finally, appointments. Now, appointments. If you look at dials to completed calls to appointments, look at those three. Now what we're measuring is, how, of the number of people I end up speaking to on average, how many people on average do I meet with? Well, let's say on average you dial 10 people, speak to three people, but one of those are three pe people meet with you. It's probably a pretty good ratio. But let's say you dial 10 people, speak to five people, and only one person talks uh, will meet with you. That's because the other four gave you an objection that you couldn't turn around. So that's where you spot your opportunity for improvement. 
you now realize, you know what, I could have improved. Uh, and that's where I need to improve. That part of it is the uh, turnaround uh, skill. So that's a great question. Good. Good. How are we doing? Uh, there's actually no more questions at all. Um, if there's anything else you wanted to add, please feel free. Um, I'd also like to thank all the attendees for coming. And then also to you, Steve, thank you for presenting the webinar today. You're very welcome, and I appreciate the opportunity to present to you. And uh, I hope I get a chance to work with you again. Until then, good luck and happy prospecting to all of you. Great. Thank you.